I have with me today uh, a Professor Miranda Wolpert, who is, and I shall read this, Director of Mental Health at Wellcome, but also a Professor of Evidence-Based Research at UCL. So she's got two strands, so it's predominantly at Wellcome. Um, We'll start off with a general conversation, and then there'll be time for Q&A at the end. And uh, if you are online, I will be able to see your um, questions coming up, just so that uh, people know. Um, so Miranda was here. Uh, she's matriculated in 1981. I always get confused between matriculation when, and... When did you start? 81. 81. So in that I case, say, it's 81. She matriculated in 1981. And um, so was here in the early days of the college being mixed. So that was nine years after the college went mixed. We're celebrating 50 years this year. And I certainly want to talk to her about that. She studied history here, but has had an interesting trajectory, which she tells me is entirely logical, from where she started to where she is now, and we'll explore that too. So, Randy, you come from a, um, an academic family. Your father was a, an academic. Your brother is an academic. How did that colour what you wanted to do with your life? Well, in some ways it was an academic family, and that my father was an academic. My mum didn't go to university, uh, uh, ran a nursery school, um, and was also a force in the family. So I think there was a, a mixture of role models there. Um, but yes, there was a lot of academic discussion and uh, debate around the table. And did that mean that academia seemed a logical path for you to take? Um, I'm not sure about that. I mean. In a way, as, I was, as we were talking about earlier, I'd been a sort of part-time academic. So I think in, in a way, my rebellion was not to go into academia. Oh, okay. So I think that, that's the route I chose to take. Okay, but you, you decided to be a rebel. You did. Yes. Right. Okay. And you studied history here. Why history? So I, at school, I was good at history and good at English and the arts. I was actually very interested in psychology and what made people tick, but the advice I got from my school was, don't do psychology, it's just about rats and labs, you will hate it. You're good at history, do history. And actually, I, I still don't know whether that was good or bad advice. So I absolutely love my time doing history here. Uh, my tutor is here in the audience, so we'll blame him for everything that happened since. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it still looks younger than me even now. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it was it was a great um, training, I think, in how to think about things and understand things. And in fact, I enjoyed it so much that I went on to do an, an MA in history afterwards at Sussex, just not because I wanted to be an academic, because I thought I hadn't finished that particular bit of the intellectual journey. So what would you include in that that you've found so useful since? So I think it gave you a way of a perspective on life that where you saw yourself as part of a sort of flow of historical events and structural changes that enabled you to see things in terms of their context. And as we were saying earlier, a lot of my work now is about how do you get science into policy? How do you influence other people to do things? And a lot of history is about how people influence each other, how they fight with each other, how things evolve, and how revolutions happen. And a, a lot of the time, one's trying to get a revolution to happen in a, in a minor way in, in a particular field. And so I'm very influenced by that. And what was Churchill like? It was great. Um, I. Uh, I was at, I went to quite a sort of academic school, I went to a very academic school, which had a long history of relationship to Oxbridge. And they were very keen for me to try for a more um, traditional college. And uh, we were, went on various visits to colleges and I came here, met Mark Goldie, who was the history tutor, and, and also just loved the ethos of the college. Just, it felt very open and friendly and non-stuffy in a way the other colleges didn't, to me, didn't feel as welcoming. And so I, from the, that moment, I said, this is where I wanted to try and go to. And when I came, I really enjoyed it. I mean, that what you're describing, not being stuffy, welcoming, that's still something we pride ourselves on. And it's interesting that that has been so all the way through, that you know, if you like, different masters haven't completely changed that. Um, 
so when you say a traditional college, I mean, you were at St. Paul's, they presumably were talking about Girton and Newnham. No, it was, no, they wanted me to go to, the particular college they had in mind for me was, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember what it's called now. <laughs> I've forgotten at this moment. Uh, I think it was Gonville and Keys. Right, which had a great tradition and still does in yes. history. Yes. yes. Okay. And you went there and thought, no. Yeah. <laughs> you, I mean, you did actually go there and look at it. So they, they set up, a, a you know, in those days, very anti um uh, openness now, I think they set up for me to go and talk to a tutor there about mm. about things in the college. And yeah, perhaps this is not one to repeat, but the, it just didn't, didn't click. For it me. didn't click, right. And I think for me also, there was something about the mix here about the science and the arts and about them taking a big intake. At that at those days, there was a big conversation in church about taking a big intake from state schools and not all from private schools. And I felt I'd had this very sort of a particular environment, and I was quite keen to to move out of that environment. And I felt for for my, I had many friends because I went to a school where lots of people went to Oxbridge. Many friends that did go to the more traditional colleges, and I felt they then slotted into quite that similar sort of environment yep. again. And so I was very glad not to have that experience. I mean, that I think is still the case. We are still, you know, right towards the top of the uh, college league table, if you like, in how many state school. Um, candidates we take. Um, so that, that I think also still applies. I have no idea what Keys is like on that front. I've not studied it. Um, but you were still came at a time when women were, I mean, we are 50-50 now-ish. Um, you you uh, came at a time when women were absolutely not 50% of the student intake. So the number I have in my head, but I don't know whether I've made this up subsequently, is that we were one in seven. But within the arts, which was a small and merry band, then it was much more 50-50. So I've got Susanna here, who was in my group, and there were three women and three men right. historians. So actually, it was much more um, even. And were you conscious of it? It's hard to say, isn't it? Because you, you, you get on with whatever the, yeah. the context yeah. was. I certainly only had positive experiences. I didn't have a negative experience of being in any way treated unfriendly or um, being unwelcoming as a woman. And I sat, I remember very clearly one of the things that drew me to Churchill was in the blurb about Churchill, they use she as the pronoun throughout, which was not used in the other colleges. And at the time seemed a bit of an affectation, but it, it spoke to me. So, I mean, I think it's interesting how these conscious attempts to appear in a particular way made a real difference. Okay, that is interesting, because I've talked to other alumni from that kind of period who seem, perhaps they were on the science side, but who seem much more conscious about it. Yes. Um, that aware that they were in a minority. And of course, you know, in a subject like my own of physics, you would have been in a massive minority in the department too. So, you know, there was never a sense that you were you know, just like everyone else, because you weren't, if you see what I mean. So to be honest, I think the minority I felt in at Churchill was the arts and humanities minority. And you were and, conscious of And that, that I was conscious of. And we had a very different life because the scientists were out at lectures and doing things. And we, Mark, close your ears, were frankly not. <laughs> you know, we were sort of, you know, wandering around, chatting, maybe doing the odd essay, but it, it wasn't the same. Yes. Structure. You had time to row, even. I mean, I don't know if you did. But... I, I did not, <laughs> but I did have time to do so had I wished to. Yes. I mean, it was always said it was practically impossible for Anatsky to do that, probably still is, because, you know, you had to be nine o'clock lecture and yeah. you hadn't come off the river kind of thing. So, Okay, so you came here, you learned about revolutions. Um, you decided you wanted to make revolutions in policy making, so you, you went off and did something totally different. Yeah, so actually it wasn't quite that I wanted to do a revolution in policy making. What I'd always been interested in is what made people tick, which was partly what I was interested in history, but what I really wanted to do was be a therapist. So I then needed to find a route into training to be a, a therapist, and the route I chose was through clinical psychology. So I, I found my way to that through various alleyways and byways. And you practiced as a therapist? Yes. So I was. I, I ended up being a consultant clinical psychologist in the health service uh, for many years, working with children, always with children always and families. Always with children, because? Yeah. 
that was what interests me. I was interested. So that in, in a clinical psychology training, you do three years of placements in different, uh, with different populations old age, adults, and children and families. And it just, I really enjoy the children and families work. And, and then, I mean, we can contrast with now, but were children being referred, was, were conditions being recognized before they became utterly extreme? Yes. Yes, so one of the reasons that child and family work is so interesting is you do see things at an earlier stage, and there is a chance for things to be turned around or for change to happen. When do you think it's the critical age? So there's a lot of debate about this, as you can imagine. Um, in terms of when mental health problems first appear, it's, it's normally in adolescence or mm -hmm. early adulthood. There is an argument that if you get an early at birth or pre-birth even, you can make a huge difference in people's lives. But, but for me, that point of sort of adolescence and early adolescence is, is an early adulthood is a really critical point and the one that I was particularly interested in. And when you say pre-birth, what, what do you mean by pre-birth? So there's work on prevention uh, in mental health, which says if you can work with the parents right. before children are born right. and also look at uh, the sort of physical and social okay. factors that they're okay. living in, that that will make a huge difference. So you're helping parents know how to be parents? Partly, or you might be changing people's diet or the, the amount of um, diseases they're affected by, all of which might have an impact. Right. Okay. So a child who comes from a perfectly, um, you know, diet's fine, no... Um, abuse or anything like that, what kind of triggers will lead to problems arising in adolescence then? So it could be a whole range of things. It, often it's a relationship breakdown or stress. I mean, the in mental health, it's always a mix of sort of biology, social factors and psychological factors. And for different people, that mix will be different. Mm -hmm. So it could be that people have a particular uh, factors in them that make them more interact with something that happens in their life. It could be a bereavement, it could be abuse, it could be bullying, it could be a whole range of things. And some people it will affect in one way, others it will affect in another. It's quite an individual trajectory. And that's why the therapist is so important, presumably, to try and tease out. It, it can, yes, they can be. I mean, how I got into sort of science through that was because we weren't very effective. And I became increasingly frustrated and worried by the fact that many people that came to see us for help, we would see once or twice and they'd never come back. And you had no idea whether that was because you'd helped them enough and they'd got what they needed and they'd gone off. But I always had the fear that it was because we hadn't helped them and they'd sort of dropped out and we didn't know whether they're any better or not. And the NHS didn't follow up? No. Because it didn't have the resources? Well, yeah. it's a good question, the why. Um, it's something I've given a lot of thought to. So, so I, I became very interested in this and was wanting to encourage us to find ways of looking at whether people had got better or not, asking them, trying to follow up in different ways. And I think it's partly resources. I think it was partly people would say, well, why would you want to know? There are so many other people wanting therapy. And I think it was also partly that people who are giving therapy want to believe they're helping. Mm -hmm. They don't really want information that's going to tell them they might not be. Oh. So there was always an argument, well, I'm sure, I'm sure they've been helped. I'm sure we did the best we could. And if they got worse, it was because they were going to get even worse. And if they got better, it's because of what we did. And I, I, it, it, it wasn't the most rigorous approach to understanding whether we were actually helping or not. So how did you go from there to the science, to the presumably the evidence, which is what yes. you would have wanted? Yes, so I, I got increasingly sort of frustrated by this and, and, and worried by it and thinking about my, and the thing that really preoccupied me was how could I know I was being the best therapist I could be if I didn't have any baseline or any way to compare myself or my outcomes that were achieved by the people that I was seeing? So I, I um, got a job in which I was the first a psychologist in a particular team. And so I had the chance to build the team and also build the sort of culture of that team. So as part of that, I started introducing routine monitoring of what we were doing. 
and a sort of more open way of writing letters to patients we were seeing so that we shared with them what we understood to be the issues, which wasn't common practice at the time. At the time, the common practice was just to write to the GP. You wouldn't include the person you were working with. So I was trying to develop a new practice, and, and I then recruited a team around me who were interested in that. So we were doing a lot of that. And other people got to hear about what we were doing. And so we used to get more and more people coming to us saying, can we hear what you're doing? Can we do something like it? And in the end, I sort of ended up holding a conference to say, well, let's just show it, because it became too much to have to have all these visits coming. Um, and then at that conference, four or five of us got together from different organizations, said we're going to form a collaboration to try and do this more rigorously across our different organizations. Um, and we just heard that adult mental health had got some money from the government to look at what the outcomes were for their work. And so I was deputed to go and talk to the government about whether I'd get money for a child. And I was told, no, wait your turn, adult will sort it out, and then, then, we will tell, then you, they'll tell you what to do with children. Uh, if you want to do this, you have to find a way of getting money yourself. So we then formed um, a consortium, and we invited people to be members of it, and we charged them for it. So we charged You charged the organization? We charged the organizations. So we sort of invented an organization, and that turned into something called the Child Outcomes Research Consortium, which is still running. Um, so we, yes, that, that's how it worked. So how much money did you need to, to make something work? So it was a mix. So, so we, we charged each organization £3,000 a year. Mm. Um, Doesn't sound very much. When was this? No, it was in, gosh, uh, it must have been the early <laughs> 2000s. Gosh, 3000 doesn't sound very much. No, we were very modest. Um, and we got, I think, about 30 organizations signed up, something like that. And we also got a loan from a, a service development organization that helped us get an administrator. And then we, um, from that, we paid for a research assistant to help coordinate and pull all the, the findings together and collect the data. So 30 organizations, were they all therapists? They were all health service. Well, they were a mix of health service and social service organizations. So they would have brought different perspectives. They weren't all trying to do the same thing in their different spheres. No, the, the, what, we, what we tried to create was an agreement about what measures we would collect for whether someone was better or not. That was, that was the task. Ah, okay. So what they did, what everyone did was up to them. This was an attempt to harmonize how you would decide whether someone was better or not and, and how you could review your work compared to other people's work. So it was like a performance uh, performance management. Performance management <laughs> community of practice. Yeah. Okay. And were the answers obvious as to what worked? Or what, because I can imagine, I can see the problem of trying to define whether someone is better. But if you were comparing what a social worker did or a therapist, um, could you then sort of put a, a basket of good practice together? So that wasn't quite what we were trying to do at this this point. So the idea for this was that we wanted to have some metric that you could use to say X percentage of people improved after I saw them. Is that getting better year on year? Is how does that compare with someone else? And if that if someone else was getting ninety percent better, and your team were getting ten percent better, there may be all sorts of reasons for that. Yeah. There may be to do with the population that was coming in. It may be to do with the sort of therapy you're doing. But the idea was to be an impetus to. to uh, encourage your curiosity to go and check that out. So this wasn't designed as a rigorous research trial in and of itself. And it wasn't about the specifics of what you did. It no. was only about whether you yourself were getting a reasonable number of successes. Yes. And how did that evolve then into? So uh, that, that, that still runs and, and, was, uh, and, and is running. And we now have a database of I don't know how much because I'm no longer involved in it, but when I left, it was about half a million uh, mm. children. So we could then create reports for each institution that allowed them to sort of look at their outcomes. And it also involved in terms of policy then taking up that model and using it. So the government then advised that model for those where the outcome measures should be used across the health service. So that got sort of mainstreamed into policy. I got then interested more in like, well, how do I, what is the intervention that we should be doing? Um, and I got approached uh, to run a grant by a very uh, visionary um, surgeon, the health service, who was running a, a project called Do Once and Share, 
which was a, uh, where they were asking for various people to do things in the health service on particular areas uh, where they wanted sort of a bit more insight. And there were two on child mental health. And fundamentally, he couldn't find anyone else to run them. So I ended up sort of putting up my hand. Isn't that putting and, yourself down just a little? OK. He, well, <laughs> anyway, I was the one that ended up uh, running these two. And the, 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 the um, way this grant uh, ran was that as long as you did what you, they'd asked you to do, you could keep the money that you didn't spend and you could use it for whatever you wanted, not obviously on yourself personally, mm -hmm. but for stuff related to whatever you felt was relevant uh, to advance service development. Um, so we ran these quite efficiently, did really good work on it. And then I used that the remainder of the money to set up an academic unit across a charity and a university in order to look at what was the best evidence-based practice in child mental health to try and help people understand what were those different interventions that would really make a difference. So you'd stop looking at the individual and you were now looking at yes. did talking therapy work or? Yes, or which sort of talking therapy right. work for whom, in what context. You could break it down that. That's the aim, yes. Gosh. And has it been effective? So for that unit then grew because what we then started to do was put in for grants and that's how I segued into research. Right. So we ended up putting in for, to research grants um, and doing different research projects, particularly looking at interventions in schools for young people and in clinics for young people, and trying to understand what worked and didn't work, including randomized control trials, including observational studies, including cohort studies. So those were the sort of projects we then started to do to try and understand. A lot of the work was trying to codify what was already known by other researchers, but also doing our own research. And that endeavor is still going on across mental health science. Interventions in schools, would that still be at the level of the individual child or would it be school ethos? Both, both. Mixture of targeted and general. So, for example, for my current role, we've just, uh, um, a, a huge project has just finished that I wasn't involved in, but uh, it was a very impressive uh, project, in fact, run from Cambridge and elsewhere called the Myriad Trial, which was looking at mindfulness in schools and looking to see whether that could prevent depression and anxiety developing. Sorry, what was it called? Mindfulness. Myriad mindfulness. Oh, mindfulness. Right, yeah. So that's where you, you train children in, in how to be mindful. It's like a form of, I guess, sort of like meditation mm -hmm. that uh, teachers were doing with children at the, at the start of lessons or at the start of the day. It's a five-year project, very big trial, where they did also all sorts of um, brain imaging to see if the mindfulness made a difference to children's way children thought. Um, and what they discovered as a result of that trial is, no, it does not um, prevent anxiety and depression. A really good trial, and I think one of, those, one of those sort of wins for mental health science in the sense it found something didn't work, and we should celebrate that as yes. much as where something does work. I, the ability to publish null results is yeah. not great. Um, but of course, mindfulness is something that, you know, it's sort of out there as something that students should use, you say it didn't work for adolescents, would it work for students, adults? Would it has it been work? shown to work for adults. So it didn't work in this context where, as a prevention measure. Right. And, and it may be partly it was that the students didn't practice, it may be partly there were other factors, but it was a very good rigorous trial with lots of people. So my advice to a policymaker would not be to roll out mindfulness as a prevention in schools. But you think the evidence is that it helps adults who are anxious? It does, it can do, and it can help individual young people. It's just as a general okay. rollout for policy, it's, it's, it's not easy enough to institute where people will do it regularly enough. So if it works for you, my advice is do it. Yes. It's not that it's ineffective for an individual, right. but in this trial it was ineffective as a general intervention right. in schools. Okay, and presumably that also depended on whether the teachers were any good at leading on it. Yeah, so one of the interesting things they found in the trials, it helped the teachers. So the teachers, they, they did find benefits from it. Okay, it's interesting. Um, so you would recommend I went off and practiced mindfulness. I've always felt like... If, if you find it useful to you, so I think the main learning I would say from mental health science is it's, it's very individual what works for different people. So it's really about finding what's right for you. And that may change at different stages okay. of your life. So trying to find something that's going to work for everyone in this room is a no-go. 
What you've got to do is find what's right for you. All of us will be touched by mental health problems, either in ourselves or in those we love or those we care about at some point in our lives. But most people will find ways through that. And that may vary from seeing a professional right through to doing more exercise, right through to changing your job, changing a relationship. And, and one of the things we are trying to do in my current work is trying to help really tease apart the elements of intervention so that we can really understand what works for different individuals. Yes, because ideally, presumably, a child presents themselves as a therapist. You don't want to say, well, try mindfulness for a year. So at the moment, pretty much all mental health interventions are trial and error. Yes. And it can take something like 10 years for people to find the thing that works for them. So what we're trying to do is really close that gap and really make it much more personalized. Yes. And the way people have to think about it, I think, is much more like a personalized diet. Like you need to find the nutrients, the mental health nutrients that are right for you. And that may change at different stages of your life. And, and certainly, I mean, there must be enormous fashions in this. I mean, I'm of the generation where if a nervous student went to see their GP, they came out five minutes later with a load of Valium. Um, there were huge fashions in it. And I had a friend who, who did this just before exams and they caused her to hallucinate. It's not a good way of going into exams. And Valium now would be a total no-no, presumably, diazepam. I think it is still used. It is still used. But there are many other drugs that are yes. used more. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, the big thing that people are very excited by is psychedelics and taking psychedelics, so that brings back the 60s. Yes. Um, no, I wasn't 60s, not that long ago. <laughs> but brings back the 60s in terms of the, the mm. sort of interest in psychedelics for mental health, so that's something... But presumably that, not LSE. Well, I, I th it, it, they do it under very constrained yeah. uh, circumstances, but it is, it is hallucinogenic drugs. Yes, okay. Okay, I hadn't heard that one, that's slightly... <clears throat> It's slightly concerning knowing what did happen in the 60s. Yes. So I think it's something that, that an increasing number of companies and researchers are looking at in controlled circumstances as a way of dealing with very deep depression. Right. OK. I suppose that's a slightly extreme yep. end of things. OK. So you had set up this consortium. Yeah. You'd started talking to policymakers by this point. Yes. What interests you about policy? So I guess there were two strands that we were interested with policymakers. One was about this issue about how could you measure outcomes in a, in a publicly funded healthcare system? How could we make sure that uh, patients had a voice and got heard and that their views were taken into account in terms of the treatments they were received? That was one strand. And the other strand was really about child mental health and how we could wake child mental health services as evidence-based as, as possible and as effective as possible, whether in uh, health services or in schools. And are policymakers just interested in saving money, or would you be more optimistic than that? So the civil servants I've worked with over the years, I've been deeply impressed by. They are really committed, hardworking people. Um, I think they are, they are very guided by their minister and their minister's interests and concerns. And they are trying to find a way of balancing cost effectiveness with effectiveness of an intervention uh, with the ideology of the time. So mm. it's, a, it's a really tough job. And I think they are, on the whole, very impressive in trying to balance those different aspects. And what do you think the key skills you need to have are if you're going to be successful yourself in pitching if you want. So I think we all need to recognize it is a skill and it requires training and thought. So I think it's about trying to put yourself in the shoes of the person you're trying to influence and think what's keeping them awake at night and how can I help with that problem rather than how can I interest them with the thing that I find interesting, yes. uh, which is I think the attitude most of us go in with most of the time. Oh, isn't it? I know the answer. Why don't you just listen? Yes, or it can even be, I know the question that you should be asking, give me the money and I'll do the fascinating research that will take 10 years to answer it. And it's a lot of money. Yes. yes, I'm afraid that is correct. You say training to have the skills you need. What training have you had to talk to policymakers? So I haven't actually had any training to talk to policymakers, but I suppose later on 
more recently, in more recent years, I have had training in sort of presentation skills or how to um, present something succinctly. And I think that is really useful. I think more scientists could do with that to sort of move out of the specifics that they are sort of very focused on, particularly the details and the methods, and move out to what is the person I'm talking to interested in and how do I get it across to them? And would that be media training? Because that's pretty close to what I feel I've learned from media training. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so how to, how to get it at the level that is comprehensible and is you can put across in one minute. Exactly. Yes, but you didn't have it through media training. No. No, and I think I wasn't very good at it. As it was, I, I think it took a long time to find right ways of getting it. I just still don't think I'm the most brilliant policy influencer, but I think it's a skill that we should all be thinking about. I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I think scientists get far too fond of the details because they spent years trying to do something, so they want to talk about it, and it's really not very helpful sometimes. Well, sometimes I think we need an intermediary, a sort of science wrangler or a scientist whisperer who explains it. So to the policy, you need an intermediary because I think sometimes the best scientists are simply not able to do this. And that's what makes them great scientists mm -hmm. because they will not give up on the detail and they will always say, well, there's this caveat and there's more research and, oh, you couldn't possibly say that because that would be going too far from the facts. And, and I think they then therefore lose their audience. So I think you need these intermediaries. But it's also about, I mean, we were talking earlier about framing of something I learned, I read a book about um, why not everyone agrees about climate change. It was called something like that, written by a professor now in this university. And it absolutely highlighted to me that the scientific facts were not sufficient. You've got to allow for the fact that how you weight intergenerational justice, for instance, you know, there are lots of, of things that have nothing to do with the science that will influence a policymaker or a member of the public. And scientists, by and large, I don't think, I don't think if you do the, the natural sciences tripos here, you'd ever hear that word mentioned, framing, and taking into account these broader issues. I completely agree. Is it better if you're trained in history? Yes. And that's, <laughs> it'd be hard to make it worse. But, um, yes, because, because in, but in any of the art subjects, because you're trained to make an argument, and what you're trying to do is pick your, your facts to make that argument whilst not distorting the facts. Whereas I think what you're trained to do in science, in, the, in some of the more physical sciences, is um, take a logical sequence through, we did this experiment, this is what we found, and this is the sort of structure with which it's, it's written. So I think it's a different training, and yeah. I think they could both learn from each other. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's slightly harsh on scientists because they'd have to still to put it in context. They'd still have to say, and blogs in Oxford did this, and it's you, you've got to explain why you perhaps got a different result. So you've still got to do some of that. You have. The reason why I feel very definitive on this one uh, um, is because having having written both ways, I think for a policymaker that the, 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 in that scientific article that you're just describing, you've got to have a thread going through from blogs to so-and-so. And, and we know it's, some of it's a bit of an artifact, but it's not written as if it's an artifact. It's right. written as if this is what we found and this is the sort of logical yes. flow. Whereas in the arts, it is, it's clearly an artifact because you've set the the parameters and you've set the argument and so people can engage with you in a different way okay and I suppose that would be my argument. it's not the one's better than the other but you need both and I certainly think that um, yeah both they can benefit from each other I, I'm going to be slightly mischievous given that most politicians do not have a science education do you think it's because you are speaking yes. to a politician who's who yes. thinks like that? I think it's a huge problem in this, in yes. this country and elsewhere. Huge problem. Yes. And so I, I, I'm so, so I see myself sometimes as that intermediary. Right. So I now know enough about the science, and having been a scientist, albeit at the social science end, I can translate in a way that I think it's much harder for other people right. to do for exactly that reason. Right. 
Yes. I, I'm, and the fault is, you know, there is a problem there with that we need more scientists in the we civil service. We need more scientists 100%. in the civil service. When 100%. I, when I chaired what was then the Science Advisory Committee or Council for what was then the Department of Culture, Media and Sports, there was one scientist in their team. They were mainly economists yep. who were described as the scientists because they were numerate. Uh, this is sort of a very scathing way of describing it, but the fact there was only one scientist just as they were taking over the digital brief, which of course they've now lost again, I felt was a, a tremendous gap. It's a huge problem and it, and it means we miss real opportunities. So in my field where we're often rolling out different types of mental health intervention, if we could just randomize just occasionally, it would make such a difference. But trying to persuade people and get them to understand what that means if, if they're not coming from a scientific background, it's really hard. But medics do that all the time. Yes, but it's a real problem to do it at a In larger a, policy. Oh, I, I mean, one of the things that we are straying from your career, but <laughs> the, the evidence that starting school later for teenagers would be beneficial, there's plenty of evidence. Newcastle, I think it was, trialled it, and yet it's still... It's obviously in the too difficult category to introduce that. But that's where we come back to, again, what you and I were discussing beforehand, which is, in my experience, policy is made based on the policymaker's belief of what they want to do. And then yeah. what they're doing is looking for ra reasons to support that yes. agenda. So, you know, we've discussed that in mental health, there is a huge correlation between poverty and mental health problems. Everyone knows that. But if you go and take that to a policymaker and say, do something about that, they may or may not fit, depending on their ideological yes. viewpoint. And if they really believed in levelling up, they might go along with that. Yeah. OK. So you're now at Welcome. What's your role at Welcome, exactly? So I have the most amazing role now. My role is to spend money. That is my, <laughs> that is my only role. So I'm Director of Mental Health. The Welcome Institute is a, a big... Uh, science research funder um, and we have committed to give away 16 billion pounds in the next 10 years. That is a lot of money. That's a lot of money and, uh, and that's to be given away on four things. Mental health, climate and health, infectious disease and then broad discovery research science. Whether or not you get exactly four billion out of that, what kind of research projects would fit your wish list? So for mental health, part of it is I want to get as much of those four areas as possible. <laughs> so I want mental health scientists to be applying for the discovery research. Mm -hmm. I want them to be looking at the impact of climate change on mental health as well. And I'm still to find a way into infectious disease, but I will get there. But well, um, you can be anxious about that too. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But, but for the specific mission for the mental health challenge. We have, we have chosen that we'll be particularly focused on anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. and psychosis, mm -hmm. and on early intervention, We're trying to get in early so these things don't disable people's lives. So it's again aimed at children and adolescents? Um, not necessarily. So it's not age limited, but it, it will often be that group because of the early intervention focus. Yeah. But in different contexts, early intervention might be quite late in someone's life. So it, will, okay. it, may, it may depend. And do you think COVID has increased anxiety? Um, I think it has had some impacts on some people. It certainly increased some of the divides, particularly for people that were in more difficult circumstances, mm -hmm. struggled more than people that were in much more fortunate circumstances. Um, long term, I don't know whether we will see a, a real effect. We funded work by a great researcher called Daisy Fancourt, who has a, um, a great website all about the impacts of COVID on mental health. And I think she would say it sort of leveled out. But it, for some populations, it was very devastating. And I mean, obviously, people who were living in cramped circumstances with trying to homeschool three children with one phone, that's, that's one extreme. But would it depend on um, the age they were at when COVID struck? I think that's one factor. Also, loneliness. Right. Big issue was loneliness how socially isolated you were, how much there were other contacts for you. And that may also depend on your life stage. Yes, because certainly, you know, anecdote, not evidence, uh, but, but the cohorts of students who lost two years of their undergraduate 
growing up, socializing, you know, or whatever, all the things that are part of becoming a young adult and were wiped out, that that is, is that going to make them more anxious in later years because they've never quite made that transition? It's very hard to know. And I think the danger of mental health is everyone's always predicting disaster and doom and gloom. So it may do, or it may be that they are more resilient as a result or form different sorts of relationships or are a generation that changes the world in other ways. So I think it's very hard to tell. And I think it's about trying to look and see that from this natural experiment what emerges. How long do you think it will take for that to become apparent? So I suppose I would, well, you'll have, you could look each year and see what the impact is each year. Yes. But I would think it may be a decade before yeah, you really I thought, know. I was, I was wondering, I, it's not going to be fast to get no. meaningful evidence. No. And even then it'll be confounded by so many other cohort effects because it wasn't random. Yeah. And other things may come along too. Yes. Yes. And, and we were talking earlier about that this, the younger generation now I think gets very sort of demonized for having more mental health needs or being more open about it. But it's also a generation that drinks much less, is much healthier, is much less aggressive. There's many, much less fighting, more socially orientated. So, you know, when we think about a generation coming up, there's real signs of hope also. Okay, so you, you're sort of implying by that that aggression was a different way, for instance, of drinking, a different way of expressing anxiety, but it wasn't expressed in that way. Possibly. And certainly I think there were, so there's an increase in depression and anxiety, particularly for young women. But uh, for boys and young men, there used to be much more aggression and violence and alcoholism. That seems to have reduced to a certain extent. Well, on that optimistic note, maybe I should throw the um, floor over to the audience. Um, we have two roving mics. So please wait for a mic to reach you because otherwise the online people won't be able to hear. And to the online folk, uh, feel free to type your questions in and I will try and read them. Um, do we have any questions? There's a long question here, which I need to look at. There's a question there, Rachel. Hello, thank you so much. Um, that was super inspiring. I'm actually a student at UCL now. I used to be at Cambridge and I'm actually applying for one of the mental health sciences program funded by Wellcome. So that was really interesting. Um, I guess my question was more about, you mentioned how some interventions might work for individual people, but not on a sort of like wider level. So Wellcome has done research on, I guess, like active ingredients and all of that. What would you say to a policymaker on what interventions could actually be effective, say, on a school level? If you found that, say, mindfulness isn't effective widely, what could you what could you do to convince them? Great question. So for people who don't know, one of the things we've been doing at Wellcome is trying to fund researchers to sort of break down the different interventions that are currently around for youth mental health into their constituent parts. Because part of the difficulty we have in mental health science at the moment is there are many people sort of campaigning for their personal intervention. And then it sort of becomes more and more sort of um, guildified over time, and it becomes harder and harder to compare because they get more and more complicated. So we're trying to sort of break them down to their component parts. So I guess what we do know, what's come out of that active ingredients work, we looked at, I think it's over 40 different active ingredients, and we were rather hoping that something would come to the fore and we'd say, that's the thing. It hasn't quite emerged in the way we would have hoped in that way, but I guess the things that have come to the fore are things like exercise. So I would say to policymakers, make sure that kids and young people are getting exercise. So one of the things, for example, thinking about mindfulness, is as mindfulness became more popular, what we found schools were doing was stopping PE lessons in order to have children sitting in the classroom and learn how to be mindful. I would suggest you don't do that. You make sure that people have a chance to run around and play, and also gives them a chance to socialize and not be isolated. So that would be one area. Another area that will come out is sleep, but there's increasing evidence that sleep is a real gateway to many of the problems that we see later on. So trying to work out ways to support uh, young people to get healthy sleep rhythms, those would be the sort of two that I would, I would guess would be sort of no regrets ones. And then there'd be work around um, things around behavioral activation where if someone is struggling, you try and find positive things to sort of move them on step by step. 
So those would be the sort of things that I would suggest is sort of at a very general level. So there's a question online. Um, a lot of my contemporaries interested in public policy and strategy roles have faced challenges, often abandoning the idea, as these roles are often London-based, and particularly early research parliamentary assistant type career roles are essentially badly paid internships. Is it a challenge getting representative diversity into policy making and what's needed to ensure policy making is an accessible career path? It's a great question and you're completely right. It's a massive challenge and I don't have an easy answer for it. I mean, I think generally where I work now, we're looking at this for, for a whole range of, of uh, issues, both in terms of our own recruitment and in terms of who we fund. But there are no easy answers here and any suggestions you've got, we're open to hearing about. And not a million miles away from that, but um, more specifically directed at welcome. It's well known that there is a huge lack of BME researchers and that they experience greater hurdles in being successful with applications for research. What is welcome doing to reduce barriers for BME researchers? So we're doing a number of things. We have committed to make a specific uh, funding call open that will be directed at uh, BME researchers. And we're just developing the details of that now. That's a public commitment we've already made. And then we're looking at all our funding schemes now to see how we can reduce barriers and skews in how we choose and select. So there are a number of initiatives we've got in place to try and address that. And it's something we talk about on a daily basis. Question in the middle. <coughs> uh, thank you very much. It's very interesting and <clears throat> hopeful with your research. I, I hope it's very, oh, well, your funding, I hope it's very successful. Um, one of the areas that I, I work on is uh, the area of despair and the disease of despair that's um, been, you know, a sociological phenomenon and identified in the, in the U.S. to start with, but seems to be more broad. And it, it, some of the the work that's done in that looks at um, you know, kind of the drivers of that, and some of those are, are dis disintegration of family, financial instability. A lot of it's in rural areas in America, so it's infrastructure, dig hay, but also there's loneliness. And, um, and my survey of the literature shows that one of the contributors to that have, seems to be um, people's involvement with social media and with just high involvement with phone usage. Uh, and we have very little um, primary data on that. We have a lot of self-report data that is on that. Um, and so I'm curious if in the, the approach that you're taking, because that seems to me to be a very important behavioral phenomenon to understand, to link to despair, mental health, and other things of that nature. If, if you're seeing um, tools or opportunities or approaches that researchers can take because it, it seems the social media companies are not very keen on letting us have access to that type of data. It's, it's a great question. I mean, I think we are looking to see how we can work with companies to give access to data to researchers. Um, there's been some work done with the gaming industry to look at games and, and that. I think one of the, I think there may be some postdocs in the audience working on social media generally. I think one of the things we have to be careful about is assuming there's, there's sort of a one way, one way into what's causing loneliness or despair or and, and where, which direction causality goes in here. So I think there is some interesting research to be done about the way social media can both support mental health and be detrimental to mental health and to think about it as part of the ecosystem around how people are experiencing their lives rather than as a sort of a source of evil that's sort of separate from anything else that's going on for them. Thank you very much for your presence this evening today and for sharing your thoughts and experience with us. Throughout um, the, um, um, the event, you have also shared a number of challenges that you faced throughout your career, maybe having to influence uh, politicians where there might have been inertia because of ideology, 
or maybe uh, addressing people who didn't have that scientific background to be um, on the same page with you. My question for you would be, how have you built resilience throughout your career to overcome these challenges? And what has given you energy to uh, move forward when you were faced with, um, yeah, with this sort of, of, of challenges that are set? Thank you very much. So I think, um, I think what's given me energy is that I'm just endlessly interested in what I'm trying to achieve and I believe in it. Like, I really want to try and understand more how we can help people and I really want to sort of take forward those ideas. And so I feel very energized by that. I suppose I feel very supported by colleagues at times of despondency. It's great to be able to come out and say, oh, that meeting went terribly and they didn't understand anything and it was ghastly. And that can be very supportive. I think what I'd share is that you have to have a degree of arrogance and just trust yourself. Um, and I, I do think we were discussing this earlier. At, there's a colleague at work who once said to me something about, well, how do you sort of bounce back? How do you not feel worried about looking a fool or getting it wrong? And I think part of that was coming from quite a privileged background and quite a privileged school where we were taught, you know, you're clever. You, you're, what you've got to say is worth saying. And I think if you haven't had that, you have to force yourself to believe that, particularly as a woman. You really have to believe that and think, it doesn't matter if I make a fool of myself. It doesn't matter if I get it wrong. I'm trying to do something that's going to change the world. And it's worth it for that point. And that no one's going to remember when you get something wrong or do something foolish because they're all thinking about their own stuff anyway. So I think, I think that would be what I try and instill in other people that just sort of have a degree of arrogance that you might not feel. Fake, fake the arrogance if you don't feel it yourself. Rob? Yes. Uh, wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Um, if I might return to a topic associated with deprivation, um, I, I'm interested whether your scope extends to uh, topics that are on the uh, borderline between psychology and criminology. Uh, for example, we know that there are um, family circumstances that um, predispose people to crime. Uh, we know that crime uh, is associated, uh, of various kinds, is associated with poor mental health, which in turn goes back to um, difficult backgrounds, sometimes authoritarian fathers, uh, sometimes uh, personal traits such as autism spectrum disorder. There's a lot of interest in what interventions might actually work with young people, uh, and also with the more subtle task of measuring which interventions the police try actually work in practice. Do you consider this kind of work to be in scope? It would not be in scope for welcome. It's really interesting, really important, but we thought, in, it, it, although we have a lot of money, it's still finite and we need to focus. So we, we are focused on anxiety, depression and psychosis for the specific mental health awards that we offer. If you're interested in that area and have a, a great idea, then you can apply through our discovery awards to the early career or mid career or uh, late career awards where you're competing with any branch of science and then everything's in scope anything that will change our understanding of, of life and well-being. So another question online. Um, in general, what kind of response do you get working with government and policymakers when discussing mental health? Is it a priority for them? And has there been a shift in recent years? I wish I could answer that by saying yes and yes. <laughs> I, what we've seen, I think, in recent years is people are more prepared to say this is really important, so important, and then, but I don't see any change in behavior as a result. And that, I find that very upsetting. So I, I um, and I would say that's globe. So there's a saying in, in mental health, sort of those of us trying to influence policy that everywhere's a developing world when it comes to mental health. There's nowhere that's, that's got this sussed. And, uh, Sometimes the very administrations that are most talking about mental health are doing the least in terms of actually doing anything about it. And it's, it's something we really want to try and find a way of changing. In terms of our ambition at Welcome, part of what we're particularly interested to try and work with policymakers on is trying to work on the need for new and better interventions and not just on the need, which is very important, but different 
on accessing existing interventions. So we need a scientific pipeline. We need a pipeline of, of new ways of thinking about and intervening that will really make a difference. Um, and we need investment in that globally. I was very moved, first, thank you for the talk, fascinating. I was very moved recently by um, a book by Horatio Clare, Heavy Light. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, he's a writer and broadcaster and writes of what he describes as his descent into psychosis and his recovery. And one of the important stages of that recovery was when he was um, sectioned in a hospital in Wakefield but he was finally released on, on to, uh, allowed out into the community and spent a lot of time at the Hepworth Gallery. So I just wonder what you feel is the role of the creative arts in mental health. We, we were discussing this earlier, but first of all, just to do a plug for, he's doing a program on Radio 4 currently, uh, which I think is the third, the third in the series is out, currently, and they're brilliant. So if you, if you really want to understand about mental health and where mental health is at, that's a great series. Is psychiatry working? Yes. It's brilliant. Yes, it's really good. So really recommend that. I think the, idea, the issue about the creative arts and mental health, it's hard to research, which is what we were discussing earlier. So there's a lot of anecdote that it really helps, and it may be for individuals. It really makes a difference. But finding a really solid research base that's going to help us sort of, um, you know, give it as a part of social prescribing is a bit more complicated. But there is, there is evidence that for individuals it can make a huge difference. But so can religion. So can other things, other things that people do. Another question from online, um, beginning with compliments. Great talk. Um, I really appreciate you mentioning the difficulties people graduating during the pandemic have had. I graduated in 2020 and feel I'm only just settling in after a year in my current role. I was wondering, how does one get into the researching field? I'm based in Cornwall, and I hold a BA ONS. I've not grown up with anyone having been to university in my family, and I would love to get into researching and or presenting, particularly around mental health and creativity. Is there a way to do this that isn't necessarily around a university PhD route? What are you looking for from applicants to the awards you've spoken of with welcome? So there's a, there's a lot in that question. Um, I think, let me start backwards. So with the awards we're, we offer at Welcome, we are open to anyone applying, but you have to have some organizational structure around you. Doesn't have to be a university, just to be clear. So it can be a charity, it can be a company, it can be um, other sorts of forms of organization. Doesn't have to be a university, but you would need some sort of organizational uh, structure around you. I think, the honest answer is it's very competitive. So just sort of putting an application without having any sort of research back. And I wouldn't want to pretend that you know anyone could just write something in and say, here, I've got a good idea. Will you fund me? That's unlikely to work. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in research, and there are a number of routes in where you can, tr uh, you can transfer across to become a researcher, the academic route would normally be a conversion course into a research subject. And there are a whole range of research MAs around at different universities that are very interesting for people to convert from, a, from one sort of study to another. If you're not wanting to do that sort of training in a university, then the other route in is to work in a, a charity or a, an NGO where they have embedded researchers or in a company where they have embedded researchers and you would learn research skills through the job. Those would be the ways that I would suggest. There's a question at the back. Thanks very much. Um, my question is about, I guess, the modality of delivering kind of therapy and things like that. So post-COVID, there's been quite a big switch from face-to-face -face contact, obviously, to online and, and kind of phone, um, not just with therapy, but also in, in primary care. And I'm interested about the evidence based around that, because that's happened very quickly from a policy point of view. And it doesn't seem like there's been a huge amount of evaluation of, of the impact of it. So there's actually quite a lot of evidence of digital therapies having equivalence with face-to-face. Um, if people actually make use of them. So there was a lot of that evidence before COVID. What we don't know is, is the effect of sort of the wholesale switch. And I think, again, it may be a mix. Um, but there's a lot of evidence for digital therapy if, if you stick with it 
having the equivalence of face-to-face -face, uh, for many circumstances. And there was a question behind. Hi, Miranda, it's Erica. Hi. Hi. So I met Miranda on Twitter. Um, what comes to mind from what you're saying is there's such a rich theme of information in those adults now who are failed out as children. So they have got chronic problem. For example, it can be some very tragic stories. And uh, they're my contemporaries, except for I'm Caucasian with a doctorate, so I suffer less. Um, and I think it would be well, welcome trying to tap into that information because that community gets crossed because science typically produces 20 years later data that they've been saying for years. And there's a degree of frustration in the closed shop nature of academia because the data are there. They just can't bridge the gap yet. Does that make sense to you? It does make sense. And we're, we're trying to bridge that as best we can. So as you know, we have a team of lived experience advisors that work with us who are people who are working alongside researchers who bring their expertise by virtue of their own lived experience of those journeys with mental health difficulties. Those are very closed shop groups. So there are digitally excluded people. And as I just mentioned, forensics, even if you close that out, certainly uh, you have to have a degree of togetherness to get to those groups. It's what we've discovered as a community. And uh, it's for me, it gets personally quite difficult because of my own intersection. But... Um, Yes, I would say I would feedback to you that those groups are exclusionary from the point of view of the people who are frustrated. And it's I helpful they to have information. It's helpful to hear that. No, uh, that's kind of why I came. Okay, I'll take one last question from online because uh, we should draw this to a close. Uh, you mentioned climate change. Is there much cross disciplinary work looking at unifying air quality pollution science and the impact on child adolescent behavior? The removal of lead in petrol was often mooted as reducing male aggression. Um, do chemists, engineers talk to psychologists? It's a great question, and we really hope they will. There's, a, there's an important study just come out looking at levels of pollution correlating with mental health problems and finding actually that the biggest impact in terms of sort of difference of amount is actually at the lower ends, and then you mm. reach a sort of plateau. Came out just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, yeah, real interesting area. We're, we're just working as welcome on a commission to look at the intersection between climate change and mental health and where we can both best invest our money. The work is being led by Emma Lawrence from Imperial, and she's going to be convening, she and her team will be convening a series of global dialogues across uh, in different places across the world to try and look at where we should focus our energies in terms of that research agenda. I sit next to the uh, director of Climate and Health at Welcome, who was always telling me it's all very well you having these talking therapies, we're all under floods. How are you going to be doing them? So, uh, you know, I am very mindful of the need to start thinking about uh, the intersection between climate change and what we can do about that, and also the effect on people's mental health of trying to be activists in relation to climate change and how we can help a generation change the trajectory that some of us have not managed to stop up till now. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to draw this to a close at this point. I suspect there are more questions out there. Uh, we can adjourn to the buttery where there will be uh, wine and soft drinks. But I think we should thank, thank you. Miranda very much for a fascinating talk and all the work she's doing as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.